brings us together. We've all heard this. I will go as far to say this is probably the most contrived thing we hear about food these days. The problem is its emotional appeal has become all but meaningless, despite the fact that people continue to eat in close proximity to one another. Today, I want to shift us from using food as a function of being together and instead give back its power as a tangible, visceral part of human connection. If we can reshape the common perceptions that food is meant to be a passive activity or a unidimensional source of pleasure and celebration or just a form of sustenance, I believe that we can better allow it to nourish us both physically and emotionally. Let's start with the end goal of human connection. For me, most of these formative moments have started exceedingly ordinary. My roommate and I sitting on the floor with a hundred wooden pieces of, from Ikea that were promised to us as a bed, with one Allen key and two bran muffins to realize its full potential. It was the unwrapping of that first terribly chalky muffin that unraveled into confessions of bodily insecurity, opened into family trauma, and coalesced into a fear of failure at our first jobs out of college. And as we sat there, we ate, we cried, and we ended up just sleeping on the floor. It is a great privilege to be in the presence of someone's vulnerability precisely because it requires the sharing of something with a propensity towards pain, with the possibility of disconnection. The aftermath of revealing our imperfections marks a new ground that we can't return from, a reorganizing of where you stand in relation to me. In this way, I argue that our framework of food in our society follows a similar pattern. It distinguishes the two of us the lot of them, into distinct categories drawn from not just what we eat, but how we eat and where we eat it. Food's soft power is its ability to shape our identities, ultimately influencing the way we see ourselves in relation to other people. Anthropologically, food shows us how we got from where we were to where we are today. For example, the rise of dairying in societies like France have evolved its population to be one that is 90% lactose tolerant, which is actually biologically very rare. It also gives us historical context to societal change, such as the perception of Italian food rising from being compared to train food, a term that James Beard himself used, to high cuisine, alongside the socioeconomic ascent of Italian Americans. It is fascinating how food can relate social behaviors with distinguishing personal ideologies, so much so that a political scientist was able to show the question, have you eaten at an Indian restaurant in the last 10 years, was a differentiating point if people had a cosmopolitanism mindset and could eventually anticipate their voting choices. What I'd like to highlight here, however, is the inherent duality of food in all of these examples. As it creates an in-group, it must also distinguish an out-group. And that delineation is not always an innocuous one. Examine the idea of lactose tolerance being a minority trait through the eyes of non-European immigrants here in the US, who were long taught that their body's rejection of milk and cheese was uncommon, if not inferior. I remember feeling so embarrassed watching my mom eat lactate pills before we would dine out at a fancy French restaurant, another reminder that we were outsiders. Look at recent instances of racism following COVID-19, where ordinary Americans hurled insults like, the Chinese deserve this because they eat bats despite the virus's very unclear origins. The fact that food can draw such a line in the sand mirrors much of our own anxieties with being vulnerable in the first place, which is why we probably so strongly prefer to see it only as a carrier of goodwill and ignore its equally divisive nature. 
As ugly as it is to acknowledge food's role as both enemy and ally, I argue that we need to do so in order to fully harness its multi-layered impact on our lives. As a chef and someone who loves to eat, acknowledging the times where food has also hurt me has not come easily. Specifically, two of my most painful memories lie at the intersection of food and shame. The first is when I'm six. It's summer camp in upstate New York, and I'm holding a small cafeteria tray as I slide down the dinner buffet and receive my evening's dinner allotment. It's a giant slab of pink meat I've never seen before. As I walk back to my table, I wish for chopsticks, puzzling over the oddity of serving something so giant and impossible to eat. Forks are a new instrument for me, so I take one and I stab that meat right in the center. I pick it up and I'm moving it towards my face now, the ham's edge angling ever closer to my mouth a little drip of meat jus starting to tease down my chin. When my teacher comes, she grabs my hand and she puts it in the air for everyone to see. We do not eat like this, she says. She's furious, but I don't know why. She's talking to everyone except for me. We have manners. By the time I'm 13, I've internalized this shame and I've manifested it into anger. I'm standing in the kitchen of our family's small house. I'm screaming at my mother that I can only eat school lunch from now on. I can't afford it, she pleads. I can feel her exhaustion, but I don't care. In this choice of me versus my family, of assimilating as an American or staying an immigrant, I hated the chains of my lunchbox, my garlic chive dumplings and stewed pork belly, that other said smelled like farts, looked like dog food. Well, you aren't a very good mom then. I win the argument, so I push that hurt deep down inside, knowing that I willingly turned my back on something that I loved. See, food is visceral because it throws into sharp relief the invisible lines that govern me and you. It forms memories that are terrifyingly crisp, and perhaps this is why we so often push it away or diminish its power, afraid of what it might dredge up. But now, the retelling of something that once ostracized me probably connected us in a new way right now because of its crossover to your own stories of loneliness, shame, and loss. With this context, if I now tell you an aside my Irish-American father-in-law requesting my food as his first meal after beating cancer, I think you would understand why that moment for me felt particularly bittersweet. We cannot remove pain and only be left with joy. So it's no wonder our current relationship with food feels sterile and flat. We've manufactured food to fit into a small ecosystem where it only ever makes us feel good, or at least not bad, with enforcements like table manners, sexual illusions like hashtag yolk porn, and of course, the lure of excess always available at restaurants with truffle, caviar, wagyu, available at a moment's notice. But the gap of vulnerability remains, and the easiest way to fill it is with planning. I know that when I first started hosting dinner parties out of a cramped one bedroom in New York City, I obsessed with curating our guest list, finding the right topics to talk about, orchestrating new age, non-icebreaker icebreakers. <laughs> we had a couple good ones over the years, I'll give it that. Once we asked guests for their biggest failures and used their answers as name cards. But there was always a hesitation in the room I couldn't push past. Every evening, as desserts began to trickle into the room, I was filled with this feeling that what was missing wasn't something that I didn't know, but something I had been too afraid to include. As a chef, expressing vulnerability and cooking are two sides of the same coin. And if I truly wanted the privilege of connection with my guests, I had to start with myself. 
So I took that memory of me at 13 and turned it into a plated dish. Here, my shame sits in a metal lunchbox. Inside are many of the same things I once hid from public view, snuck in bites of on the toilet, except now it's been gentrified into something clever and expensive for the benefit of everyone else. Garlic chives, the newly discovered secret to Chinese cooking. Freshwater eel, with no barbecue sauce to mask its robust flavor. Sweet potato with an uncanny oceanic brine from oysters, once a poor man's rations, now a restaurateur's cash cow. Duck tongues, creamed into a sauce that envelops white snow fungus punctuated by mealworms. It's a small dish, just three bites, over quickly like the insults and the whispers, but the flavor, I know, will linger uncomfortably in the back of everyone's throat. Food's faculty in highlighting the complexities and often the hypocrisies of human relationships has become the founding principle of the nonprofit that's grown out of these dinner parties. In our series, Asian in America, I take the model minority myth and present it as a maze. The tension between believing in the American dream and occupying the constant state of being in between. That bold green is from chrysanthemum, an East Asian staple that's now become so popular, American chefs are laying claim to discovering it altogether. Yet no one speaks up. Acceptance and sacrifice are bound tightly together for the model minority, and I too fall in line. The star of the show is veal sweetbreads, the one exception that offals are distasteful, a reminder that everyone is welcome here, as long as you present an approachable, palatable version of yourself. I hide all of this under a steamed rice sheet, its slippery texture so off-putting to many, just like my perpetually incorrect answer to, where are you uh, from? <laughs> there will always be a you and a me. But when we allow food to reflect our full range of emotions, we also give it the fluidity to find moments where we occupy the same space. I think this is what we are reaching for when we say food brings people together. We always have intuitively associated food with closeness because both require connecting with some deep part of ourselves. This repeated exposure doesn't always get easier, but it does become more rewarding. I can now say that unless I feel absolutely petrified of a dish landing on the table, it's probably not ready yet. Food has always been more about more than just sustenance for us as human beings. It is rooted in feeling, its visceral nature, a result of both how we physically interact with it and emotionally attach to it. Its ordinary nature belies an extraordinary ability to infuse intimacy into our everyday and also offer a cross-section into our relationships, both with ourselves and with others. So tonight, I urge you, let that connection start at your dinner table, even if it's set for one.